started, first of all, we're going to be concluding our time today with communion. So when you came in the door, you were given a little communion supply like this. By the way, always gluten-free around here, so nothing but the best for you. But when you came in the door, hopefully you got one. If you did not get one, please poke your hand up in the air. We'll make sure you get one. So someone, staff member, I see Chandler, you're a good candidate. So some communion supplies, if you need them, poke your hand up, they'll get them to you. We will conclude the message with communion, so you might want to make sure you get it. And then for those of you online, you might want to just send someone in the other room, go get some juice and some bread, so when we close our message time, you can participate in communion as well. So remember, keep your hand up so we can get the supplies to you. And we're excited about the series we've been in, Unchanging God, because the truth is, we live in an ever-changing world. Like, as we talked about earlier, this world's just changing all the time. Where can you find something that just doesn't change? Well, that something is someone. His name is God. And today, we're going to be talking about how God is a holy God. So if you have a Bible, turn to Isaiah chapter 6. We'll be in the Old Testament, Isaiah chapter 6. And if you don't have a Bible, no worries. Everything will be on the screen so we can move through the message together. I'm going to begin with a question today. Here's the question. How would you define success in the Christian life? Like, to be doing the right Christian thing looks like what? How would you define that? If you've been around Christianity for a while, you would have a set of thoughts in your head, but maybe you're not a Christ follower. You go, I, I don't know. How, how would you define it? Because here's the important thing. However you might define what success in the Christian life looks like, it's very important. However you define that, it's going to define you. So it's really important we get clear, like, what's success in the Christian life? One time a young boy ran up to his mom and said, Mommy, Mommy, guess what? I'm nine feet tall. And she was like, nine feet tall? How'd you figure that out? He said, well, I took off my shoe. And I measured myself with that. And so with my shoe, I'm nine feet tall. And she said, sweetie, we don't measure our height with our own shoe. Our height is measured by a 12-inch ruler. Let me ask you again. How would you determine measure success in the Christian life. Because truth is, there are many of us here, we'd say, oh, success would be like number of years as a Christian. Like the longer you're a Christian, more success. Some would say that. Others might say, oh, you could measure success in the Christian life in terms of like number of times you attend a church event in over a month. The more events, the more successful. Or maybe some of you might define success in the Christian life in terms of like number of Christian friends that you might have or maybe number of ways that you volunteer or serve or give or maybe the number, some of you would honestly define the Christian life in terms of the number of studies that you've completed. So here's the bad news today. Using those kinds of measurements, events that we attend, studies we complete, years as a Christian, using those kinds of measurements it's like taking off our shoe and measuring ourselves with our own shoe. Those are just contrived standards. Here's the good news today. On every page of Scripture, we can see success as God's people. Here it is. Success as God's people looks like this. It looks like living in light of who God is. However God reveals himself to be, to live in light of who God is, that's success in the Christian life. In fact, you could say it this way. Who God is is supposed to drive how we live. I know it's kind of a revolutionary concept. Think about it, though. Who God is is supposed to drive how we live. A.W. Tozer wrote a book years ago called The Knowledge of the Holy. Honestly, it is the best book on this subject of the attributes of God or the character qualities of God. And in The Knowledge of the Holy, A.W. Tozer wrote these words. He said, holy is the way God is. To be holy, he does not conform to a standard. He is that standard. God himself in his holiness is the standard. Now listen, more than anything, friends, I'm talking just completely honest with you. More than anything, you know what the world needs today? You know what your family needs today? You know what you need today? You know what our church needs today? Your business? You, you know what the world needs more today? It needs more of us to understand and align ourselves with the holiness of God. That's what this world needs more and more of. The question is, where would you begin? Well, that's what we're going to start with today. So here's our big idea. You can write this down. Here it is. Our ultimate happiness flows from God's perfect holiness. 
our ultimate happiness flows from God's perfect holiness. Now help me out nice and loud. I don't want to hear your voice. True or false? Nobody. And I mean nobody. It's perfect. True or false? It's true. Nobody is perfect. Nobody except, of course, for God. And there's a word for that. And that word in the Bible, it's a Bible word. It's the word holy. So when you hear the word holy, what comes to mind for you? Because for many of us, when we hear the word holy, what comes to mind is we picture like harps. Or maybe you picture a halo. Or for some of us, when we picture God as holy, we imagine something somehow formal and stuffy. Or maybe, maybe even some of us, when we hear the idea of holy, we picture God like the Pope. He's dressed in like ceremonial garb and he's just waving at us from a distance. I'm holy. You stay over there. I'm over here. For many of us, that's how we think of holy. Now, according to scripture, holiness is God's primary attribute. The word holy occurs 544 times with reference to God. In fact, the book that we're in today, Isaiah chapter 6, the prophet Isaiah calls God the Holy One no less than 30 different times. The question is, what does it mean when we say God's holy? Well, I'm glad you asked. You always ask such riveting questions. So what I do is I put together a definition of holiness. When we say God is holy, what does it mean? Here's the summary of what Scripture says. God is holy means that God is separate from and high above all that he's made. God is always pure in character and beautiful in splendor. That's a pretty loaded definition. But that's the theological definition that expresses what the Bible says about the holiness of God. In the scriptures, holy is God's name. In fact, he calls himself this in Isaiah 57, 15. God says that he inhabits eternity whose name is holy. Jesus called God holy father in John 17, 11. Jesus taught his followers, you and me, to pray a certain way. He taught us to pray hallowed or holy be thy name, Matthew 6, verse 9. So holy is God's name, but also holy is God's nature. God says this in Hosea eleven nine. God says, I'm God and not man. I'm the holy one. Scripture says this, God asked the question, to whom will you compare me? Says the holy one, Isaiah 40, verse 25. And all around the throne of God in heaven, the redeemed say, you alone are holy. Revelation 15 and verse 4. When we look at the holiness of God in Scripture, it has both negative and positive aspects to it. Negatively speaking, the holiness of God means that God is separate from all that is evil and impure. Not, I mean, the students over here, I mean, like, just kind of, whatever's evil and impure, that's not who God is. So negatively separate from that, but positively, the holiness of God means that God's essential nature is 100% absolute purity and integrity. Where can you find 100% integrity? Only one place. God and God himself. So God is 100% morally perfect. Always. God is all holy. He's ever true. He's never changing. Holiness calls our attention that all of God's attributes are holy attributes. His love is a holy love. Time out. That's different from a pampering love. God does not pamper his children. If your parents are pampering you, I'm sorry, but that's not how God parents. God's love is a holy love. God's justice is a holy justice. That should inform the way we're praying for the Ukraine right now, shouldn't it? That should inform the way we are praying about the issues in our world. God's justice is a holy justice. There's an old saying, the wheels of God's justice move very slowly, but grind very slowly. Finally, God's word is a holy word. His truth is a holy truth. His mercy is a holy mercy. So let's let this sink in for just a second. God's essential nature is all holy and unchanging. How unlike us. We have good days, bad days, good moods, bad moods, good intentions, bad intentions, but not so God. He's all holy. He's all holy in all that he is. He's all holy in all that he says. And he's all holy in all that he does. Look at it this way. As as light is the essence of the sun, holiness is the essence of God himself. God is a holy God. And so I said it before and I'll say it again. Who God is is supposed to drive how we live. He's a holy God. How should we live? 
uh, Warren Wearsby is one of the Bible commentators. You, you will never hear a preacher preach who is not reading Warren Wearsby ever in your life. We all read him. Warren Wearsby wrote these words. I want you to see them. He said, happiness, not holiness, is the chief pursuit of most people today, including professed Christians. They want Jesus to solve their problems and carry their burdens, but they don't want him to control their lives and change their character. It doesn't disturb them that eight times in the Bible, God said to his people, be holy, for I am holy, and he means it. In other words, who God is is supposed to drive how we live. What does that look like when it comes to the holiness of God? That's what we're going to see today in Isaiah chapter 6. Let's get some background before we jump in. Isaiah was a prophet who prophesied uh, about seven centuries before Christ. He spoke in and around Jerusalem during a time when Israel's leaders were failing. Sound familiar to anybody? He spoke at a time where the nation's institutions were failing. Sound familiar to anybody? He spoke at a time where everything was upside down, nothing was going right, everything seemed to be going wrong. Does that sound familiar to anybody? In fact, if you read those first five chapters of Isaiah, you see the sins of God's people on full display. Spiritual indifference, meh. Social injustice, meh. And also radical violence. But when you get to Isaiah 6, where we're going to be, we see this vision that Isaiah gets of God. And it's a call. It's a ministry. And here we see how God's holiness, listen, God's holiness brings healing. God's holiness brings wholeness. And God's holiness ultimately brings happiness. It's how to experience the holiness of God. If you're a note taker, you can write this down. So experiencing God's holiness involves, number one, the vision of an all-holy God. It all goes back to vision. The most important thing about you or me or anyone is our vision of God. How you see him is the most important thing. That's where everything's heading. Vision of an all-holy God, that's where it all begins. Now, by show of hands, how many of you have ever heard of this concept? It's a concept called the end of an era. You ever heard of that? End of an era? End of an era? Some of you have heard of it? Now, I'm from Chicago, and we had ourselves quite an era when it came to basketball. In the 1990s, we had six championships in eight years, but in 1998, at the close of the NBA Finals, that era of success came to an end. <laughs> Chicago fans have been pining for those days ever since. Think about COVID-19 with the incursion of this pandemic. Listen, came the end of an era. Came the end of an era for businesses. There are many of you that the way you do your business has changed forever. Remember when you couldn't hardly get takeout? Now you think about food, it's at your door. <laughs> it's a new world. Change business forever. How about education? Is school the same way it was before? Not at all. It changed. It's the end of an era for the way education was done. How about church? The way church was done, it's an end of an era. It's just a different time. Things are different. And the result is that many of us are living in a harsh new reality. And, and what we want more than anything is we want the old one. Are we going to get the old one? No, we're not. At the end of an era, we find ourselves asking, what's going to happen? So here's the question I put to you today. When you're living through the end of an era, what do you need the most? Because I would submit our human nature is we want to go back. Just take me back. According to Scripture, when you come to the end of an era, what you need more than anything is a fresh vision of the holiness of God. We're in Isaiah chapter 1, or verse 6, and I want to show you verse 1. Isaiah 6, 1 says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. I draw attention to those two words, Uzziah died. God gave the prophet Isaiah a vision of his holiness, as the text says, in the year that Uzziah died. Very important. Uzziah was one of Israel's best kings. He was in the southern kingdom of Judah. He led the kingdom to a period of great prosperity. He reigned for, get this, 52 years. Can you imagine having a president, the same one, for 52 years? Sometimes it feels like it, but they actually had one. 52 years, this guy reigned. He was a good king. However, his latter years were marked with corruption, 
complacency. He grew arrogant, and he actually profaned God's temple. And as a result, he contracted leprosy, and he died in shame. You want to read the story? 2 Chronicles chapter 26. It was the end of an era, and everything and everyone had been shaken up. Here's the bad news. All of our cherished eras will have an end. Here's the good news. Our God is unchanging. All of our cherished errors will come to an end, every single one. But our God is the unchanging God. And at that very moment of crisis, right at the end of an era, Isaiah says, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne. Now listen, here's the thing. The earthly throne had been vacated, but the heavenly throne was not vacated. And it doesn't matter who's sitting on the earthly throne. It doesn't matter who is or isn't sitting on our earthly thrones. Doesn't matter, didn't matter, will never matter. What matters is who is sitting on the heavenly throne, and that is God himself. And in his presence, these magnificent winged seraphim, these these creatures are just proclaiming his glory. Let's continue Isaiah chapter 6. Look at verses 3 and 4. And one of these beings called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And all the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called. And the house was filled with smoke. We we'll draw attention to those words there. Holy, holy, holy. Not once holy. Holy. Not twice holy, but thrice holy. God is the holy, holy, holy God. Two times in scripture, the scene around the throne of God in heaven has creatures saying holy, holy, holy. One in the Old Testament, right here in Isaiah 6, 3, but one in the New Testament at the end of the Bible, Revelation 4, 8. And this vision of God's holiness, listen, this vision of God's holiness exposes something. God is holy, holy, holy. What does it expose? It exposes our, honestly, our lack of reverence. Because so often when it comes to the presence of God and the holiness of God, we're casual on one end or we're cavalier on the other. We just either just kind of mumble, who cares? Or even worse, we just kind of rush right in like there's no big deal and we just have a lack of reverence for the very holiness of God. In the words of that great theologian, Elvis Presley, (laughs) he said, wise men say, only fools tell me, rush in. Now listen, in this text, what did we just see? We saw that God is called holy, holy, holy. He's not called love, love, love. God is love, says in 1 John 4. Why isn't he called love, love, love? Because his primary attribute is holy, not love. His love is a holy love. But his primary attribute is holy, holy, holy. Why isn't God called good, good, good? On every page of the Bible, we see the the truth that God is good. Why isn't he called good, good, good? Because his goodness is a holy goodness. Holiness is the primary attribute attribute of God. His essential nature and his essential character is perfect, 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 pure, 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 holy, holy, holy. The standard by which we know all that is true and good and beautiful is not our own shoe or other people's opinions or what Christians say or what's on the radio or TV or TikTok. It doesn't matter. It's the, it's the very holy character of God revealed to us in the scripture. Remember the context now. Don't forget the context. It's the end of an era. A beloved king had died. Everything was changing for the worse. The nation was in peril, which is foreign to us. We've never had that in our lifetime. And there was very little that they could actually do. So the question we go back to, what did they need more than anything? And scripture tells us what they needed. They didn't need to go back. They didn't need another king. They didn't need a different leader. They needed a vision, a fresh vision of who God really is. He's the holy God. Holy, holy, holy. Martin Lloyd-Jones put it this way. He said, go and read the history of revivals. Never has there been a revival, but that some of the people have had such visions of the holiness of God and the sinfulness of sin that they scarcely know what to do with themselves. 
But friends, when it comes to the end of an era, listen, when it comes to the end of the era, you didn't come to the end of an era. You came at the beginning of an opportunity for revival. At the end of every era is the opportunity for seeing God for who he really is, not who we thought he was, and for living in light of that. So experiencing God's holiness involves, first of all, the, the vision of an all-holy God. It always starts with vision. But secondly, it also involves the recognition of our unholy self. It also involves the recognition of our unholy self. Now, by show of hands, everybody help me out. I want to see everybody's hand. How many of you, by show of hands, consider yourself to be, I want you to raise your hand and keep it up, you consider yourself to be a normal person. Come on, hands up, hands up, keep them up, keep them up. Now look around the room. Look who's got their hands up. These people think they're the normal people. Is this scary or what? This is the normal people. So let's do this. Let's have a little thought experiment. What if you, normal person, what if we stood next to you another person? Let's say, I don't know, um, let's see, someone that you might know. Let's say next to you we stand Vladimir Putin, all right? If we put that dude next to you, which one of you seems more like the normal person? It'd be you, definitely you. You'd look at him, you'd be like, mm, that guy, evil guy, bad guy. Of course, you'd be the normal. Let's change the image, though. Instead of you standing next to Vladimir Putin, let's, let's say that you are now standing next to, I don't know, um, Jesus Christ. Now let's ask the question. Which one of you looks like the abnormal person? It's you. It's definitely you. Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm not normal. I'm not, I'm not normal. Turn to your other neighbor and say, you're not normal either. Not even close. It's in the light of God's bright and holy character that each one of us, we can see that we're actually not really normal. We're not really normal. William Commentator, uh, the Bible commentator, William Barclay, put it this way. He said, we never really see ourselves until we see ourselves in the presence of Christ. Then we awake to ourselves and our need of God. It's only in the light of the holiness of God that we can see that there's some unholiness in us. Isaiah continues, Isaiah chapter 6. Notice verse 5. See what happens next. And Isaiah says, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Notice those three words there. Woe is me. When he's saying whoa, he's not like whoa. It's a different whoa. It's not whoa. It's like whoa. Like bad whoa. Not cool whoa. Bad whoa. These are actually the first spoken words of Isaiah in the entire book thus far, right here. He gets a vision of the holiness of God and he has a crisis. Deep inside, he feels a sense of woe. Deep inside, he feels like he's lost. And the scriptures say right there two times. I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell among a people of unclean lips. Here's the question. Why is he talking about unclean lips? Well, unclean lips are a reflection of an unclean heart. Remember, Jesus taught us that in Matthew 12, that out of the heart, your mouth speaks. How do you tell what's going on in the heart, the quality of the heart, what well, comes out of the mouth? So unclean lips are a sign, unclean heart. That's just like, what's going on here? <laughs> Here's what's going on. At the sight of the all-holy God, at the sound of holy, 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 and in the presence of the holiness of God, Isaiah recognizes his unholiness and his response, woe is me. Verses six and seven, he continues. Then one of the seraphim, those winged creatures, flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar, and he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Draw your attention, verse 6, to the word altar. He took this coal from the altar. What's the altar? Well, that's where the Old Testament priests would sacrifice the animals for the forgiveness of sin. And so from this very altar, a burning coal is taken from the place where the sacrifice for forgiveness was made. And verse 7 says it touched his mouth twice. And I think it's interesting that this holy thing touches Isaiah's dirty mouth. And instead of him being hurt, 
he's healed. Huh. And the text says that his guilt was taken away. Can you imagine? What would that be like for that nagging little voice, that nagging little guilt? What would it be like if that were taken away? And his sin was atoned for. Like, what's going on here? Well, what's going on is we have God dealing with human sin. Why is he doing that? Well, I have both good news and bad news for you. Here's the good news. God is an all-loving God, and he wants to relate with you. That's good news. Here's bad news. God is an, uh, an all-holy God, and he can't relate with our sin. You see the conundrum right there? Hey, I'm all love. I want to relate with you, but I'm all holy. I can't relate with your sin. Something's got to give here. It's got to be that sin thing. It has to be dealt with. It has to be dealt with. What do we do? Well, in the Old Testament, God in his holy love provided a way to remove the guilt, atone for sin. It was the sacrificial system. Basic idea, a life for a life. The wages of sin is death. You place your hand on the animal, you confess your sin, sin goes to the animal, animal dies, forgiveness goes to you because of the blood being shed. The life of the animal for your life. There's your forgiveness. Problem is, the Old Testament forgiveness was temporary. It was based on a system. It was temporary. So the cycle was called sin, confess, and confess, and confess, and confess. You had to do it over and over and over, and it just didn't last. It's kind of like kicking snow on something. You can cover it, but it's still there. It covers, but it does not resolve. Contrast that with the ultimate forgiveness available through Jesus, the sinless Son of God. What he offers to us is a permanent forgiveness, a once-for-all sacrifice. And like Isaiah, whenever you catch even at all, even a glimpse of, of the holiness of God, you automatically feel like, woe is me. I'm not like that. What do we do with that? Well, I think we should do what Isaiah did. Three simple things. You can write them down. Here's the first one. First step would be conviction. Conviction is that moment where you go, woe is me. And you should feel that. Listen, if your reading of the Bible, and I hope you do read it, if you do not open the Bible and see who God is and say, oh my gosh, woe is me. I'm not like that. Then something's missing. Because when we see God's beautiful, perfect character, we automatically see that we are not like that. And so if you feel woe, that's good. That's a good place to begin. The second thing, so conviction, woe is me, should lead to confession. That is, I'm unclean. Like, I need God to clean me, make me clean. No one else can do it. I can't numb it. There's nothing I can. The only way to resolve it is God has to do something. So conviction should lead to confessing, and then thirdly is cleansing, and that's where the sin is atoned for. You know, it's almost like a process. See that? Conviction. Confession. Cleansing. The result, verse 7, guilt taken away. Sin atoned for. And you know, the big result wasn't just the removal of those things. It was the restoration of the enjoyment of the holiness of God. That's what we long for. Whenever you see something beautiful, and it strikes you deep inside, like it scratches some itch for beauty, guess what that is? That's, you were made for the holiness of God. That's just a little taste of what it would be like to be in his presence. We were made for that. In writing about the permanent forgiveness available through the finished work of Jesus on the cross, Tim Keller wrote these words. He wrote, in the gospel, the good news about Jesus, we are both brought lower and raised higher than we can imagine. We're brought lower. I'm unholy. You're unholy. But we're raised higher. That in Jesus, through his death, we are made holy. We are called holy. We get a forgiveness that's not temporary. Sin, confess, sin, confess. It's permanent. If you belong to him, this forgiveness belongs to you. So the bottom line is that God is all loving. He wants to relate with you. But God is also all holy. He can't relate with our sin. And rather than a system, he sends a person, Jesus, to provide what we could never do for ourselves. And that means that all of our unholiness must be recognized and it must be resolved. So experiencing God's holiness, first of all, it involves the vision of an all-holy God. Secondly, it involves a recognition of our unholy self. But thirdly, it also involves the mission to an unholy world. Mission to an unholy world. Let me see your hand if you agree with this statement. There's a lot of bad in this world. Raise your hand. Let me ask you, where did it come from? Did it drop from the sky like snow? It's just bad. Bad fall. It's bad. We need to shovel the bad. It'll go away. Is that where it comes from? Does the bad come just like down out there? Because I believe that the, and the scriptures teach clearly that, that the bad out there is nothing more than the collective echo of the bad in here. The bad in me 
the bad in you, the bad in us. And no one needs to convince you. You know. I know. So what's behind all that bad? It's the reality that we do fall short of God's character. So how far short do we fall? And again, I must commend you on your exemplary question-asking skills. Very good. How far short of God's holy standard, his holy character, do we fall? Well, I just want to give you a basic illustration to at least give you some idea. This is a wild underestimation, which should cause woe is me. Imagine with me for a moment that on any one day you have just one unholy thought, only one, and just one unholy word, and just one unholy deed per day. I know, just just play along. Thought, word, deed, one of each per day, just one. Multiply that times a year, you're at about a thousand. With me? How old are you right now? What's your age? Multiply that number times your age. What do you got? I have 53,000 ways that I live out of the brokenness of unholiness. How old are you? You have that many thousand ways. And this is a gross underestimation. Like, we're nowhere even in the ball. You see the problem with... There's some of us strutting around as if God is like, should be proud that we're his kids. It's like, you know what you contribute the sin that Jesus died for. That's my contribution. Where's the reverence? Where's the humility? Where's the woe is me? Where's the appreciation for the grace of God that offers a free gift, unearned, through faith in Jesus? So not only do I have 53,000 ways there are 7.9 billion people on this planet right now. Multiply. Just do the math. The question is this. What's God doing about all that badness? What's he doing about it? Well, let's continue. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 8. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am. Send me. Notice the word whom and who. For the first time in Isaiah, God speaks. This is it, first time. What does he say? Whom shall I send? Whom shall go from it? Why is he sending? Why is, why is God sending? Well, he wants to turn his people from unholiness back to holiness. And God's like, in order to heal the brokenness of his people, he needs a spokesperson. spokesperson. Not just any old spokesperson will do. He needs a spokesperson who knows what it means to get a vision of God's holiness and, and get a sense of their own unholiness and to be broken by it and then experience forgiveness. Who could such a candidate be? Isaiah's like, here I am. I've seen who you are. I've been broken by my unholiness. I've been forgiven. Let me ask you a question. Why do you think God wants to forgive you through Jesus to bring you in his family? Why? Just for you? Is it just for you? Is it only for you? Or is it, could it be that he wants to bring his forgiveness into your life so he can bring his forgiveness through your life to other people and thereby address the brokenness in the world by us being agents of the forgiving grace of God? Could that be? Let's continue, Isaiah 6, verses 9 and 10. And he said, this is God speaking, go and say to this people, or then it's the people of Israel, keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy. Blind their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn and be what? I'll give you another shot at that. See with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. Healed, healed, healed. Here's the point. Isaiah 6, 9, and 10 are repeated six times in the New Testament, four times by Jesus Christ. He's referring to the religiosity of God's people had so corrupted them that they could no longer even appreciate God's word, hear God's word, respond to God's word, except for doing their own thing. Their unholiness, their religious unholiness had so infected them that they can't even hear God's word anymore. And God's like, let them continue. When the truth is, God has a mission for this unholy world to send his people 
who have experienced his forgiveness, who have glimpsed his holiness, to go out into an unholy world and share the goodness and forgiveness of God. The key word is the word go. Go. Why have you experienced his forgiveness? So that you can go with it. Yes, to bring you into relationship with God, but also to bring all that you know into relationship with God and all those where you live, work, and play into relationship with God. You can't spell the word God without the word go. You can't spell gospel without go. You can't spell good news without go. We receive this forgiveness so that we can go with this forgiveness out into a bad, broken, unholy world and share the only way to forgiveness and restoration with God. Now here's a mind blower. The vision that Isaiah saw was none other than a vision of Jesus Christ himself. So really, can you prove it? Mm -hmm. John chapter 12, verse 41. Isaiah said these things because he saw his glory and spoke of him. The he and the his is Jesus. And there are two recurring themes that run right through the Bible. One is our sin, and the other is Jesus. Sin is our problem. Jesus is God's solution. Sin is our sickness. Jesus is the cure. Sin brings darkness. Jesus is the light. Sin makes us unholy. Jesus makes us holy. Dr. Adrian Rogers, one of my favorite preachers from a, from a generation back, wrote it this way. I really want you to hear this. Here's what he said. Holiness is not the way to Christ. Christ the way to holiness. Can you see the difference? Holiness is not the way to Christ. Christ is the way to holiness. So you go, okay, all right, okay, God's a holy God. I'm an unholy person, right? God wants to, like, deal with my sin and resolve that so that I can belong to him and then be a part of his plan to heal the world, right? So how does that work? Great question. Here's a way to think about it. In the realm of hygienics, there's a principle called Imbesis Law of the Conservation of Filth. You're like, eh? I know, exactly. Let me explain it. Imbesis Law of the Conservation of Filth works like this. Track with me. In order for something dirty to be made clean, something clean must be made dirty. Got it? In order for something dirty to be made clean, Something clean must be made dirty. Picture a whiteboard with a bunch of black ink on it and a white towel. In order for that whiteboard to be white again, that white towel has to take that black away from it. In order for something dirty to be made clean, something clean must be made dirty. In order for something unholy, in order for a human, a human who is unholy, to be made holy, a holy human must take the unholiness. Where can we find a holy human being who has never sinned, who is righteous in every way, who never did what we do wrong, Con? Where can we find such a person? It's Jesus Christ. Scripture calls him the righteous one. The righteous one took away our unrighteousness so that we might be made righteous in him. The Holy One took away our unholiness on the cross so that in Him, in relationship with Him, in belonging to Him, we are called holy. Scripture says it this way in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 14. It says, For by a single offering, He, Jesus, has perfected for all time those we're being sanctified. Notice that statement there, a single offering. On the cross, Jesus, the sinless Son of God, took our sins upon himself once and for all. The result, that those who trust in him, the scripture says, will be called perfected for all time. In other words, if you belong to Jesus, if you've given your life to him, you are called holy in him. It's not your holiness, it's his holiness. He takes your sin, you get his holiness. So when God looks at you, he doesn't see your sin because Jesus took that away. He looks at you through the lens of Christ. So God treated Jesus as you deserve so that he can treat you as Jesus deserves. And he's the holy one and the righteous one. And that's how God sees you in his son. And notice also a process. Yes, perfected. Once for all, through the once for all sacrament, but also being 
sanctified. The moment we receive the Spirit into our lives when we trust Jesus, the Holy Spirit gets to work on a process called sanctification. It simply means taking those thoughts, words, and deeds that we can't change on our own and empowering us to live in alignment with God who is holy so we can start having holy thoughts, holy words, and holy deeds. And our unholy thoughts, words, and deeds don't define us anymore. Jesus does. And now we're empowered by his own spirit to think, speak, and act as God intended. J.I. Packer put it this way. He said, to those who are Christ, the holy God is a loving father. They belong to his family. They may approach him without fear and always be sure of his fatherly care and concern. Would you pray with me? God, we recognize every time we open the scriptures, you reveal who you really are to us. And today we see that you are holy, holy, holy. You alone are perfect. You alone are pure. You alone are unchanging. And we thank you for sending your own son, Jesus Christ, into this world to do for us what we could never do for ourselves, to live the perfect life on our behalf, and then to offer a perfect sacrifice for our sin. And then three days later, rising from the grave to prove that in him we have permanent forgiveness, permanent belonging, and your very own spirit to indwell us. Our prayer today, Holy Spirit, will you empower us to live in alignment with the Holy God who sent his sinless Son who empowers us through the Holy Spirit. It's in your name we pray and everybody says.